And I do believe that consistency is one of the most important and vital elements to the equation. You cannot just post something on Monday and then in a week later think that that's going to create you know, a, a massive follower impact or growth or traffic to your website. So we're really going to dive into kind of these five steps to define a 30-day content calendar. And I also want to just, just set up like why 30-day content calendar? I always believe that if you can look at the month ahead and start to plan at least 30 days out, you are saving so much time in your day-to-day -day throughout the following month and also allowing you to prep with a virtual assistant or yourself or, or a content coordinator on your team that you can kind of set it and forget it in, in a way, but also engage in real time. So you're not creating and engaging. And, and also, I think when you think you have to create content every single day, that's one of the reasons why we don't. It's just, it's too overwhelming. So Natalie, let's kick things off. You know, when it comes to step number one in creating that consistent content calendar, where, where do we begin here? Chelsea, I think you nailed it when you used the word overwhelming. A lot of people hear 30 day content calendar and they think I don't have time to create 30 days of posts. What I'm here to tell you and maybe ease your concerns a little bit about is a 30 day calendar can be a calendar shell. It can be a Google document or spreadsheet where you're peppering in ideas for 30 days, not necessarily writing out every single post in advance. Um, and what I often say is one of the most beautiful things about social media is that you don't want to plan every single thing. You want to leave room, I would say 20 or 30% of your content really should be in the moment, impromptu, uh, let that beautiful snow day that Russell's experiencing be part of something that perhaps you couldn't have planned but you did want to address or do something fun in. Um, and the clients that we advise, although they may be large businesses, the same advice I can actually give to our small business clients or even people. Um, you know, that 30 day shell is what prevents you from feeling like waking up in the morning and being like, what do I post today? You have that calendar you can go back to and really have a sense of, okay, here are 10 really strong ideas. And I love that because you kind of make it even less overwhelming if you think about it as a shell, uh, a shell, a framework, a spine. I like to use that term, right? Um, where you have kind of the concept of your meat, but you can kind of fill in the, the sides, the vegetables and the carb, right? So that, you know, you have that real time, right? Something can happen tomorrow monumentally in the world that you want to get in on in real time. Um, there could be a holiday season occasion that can kind of shift, you know, the messaging for the day. So it might want to have a little flexibility, but to have that spine is always, to me, equals peace of mind. Absolutely right. Well put. Um, and one thing to really weave into that shell also are, are those wonderful social media holidays you don't want to ignore that really can help you get visibility on your posts. Uh, we just created our February shell for our calendars. There's everything in there from, of course, things like Black History Month to Social Justice Day, Digital Learning Day. So what are those key moments that make sense for your personal brand or your small business? They're not going to be right for everyone. They may not always work for you. But as long as you sort of have those calendared, you're not going to wake up you know, in the morning after a holiday and say, oh man, I missed this thing that could have been really good for my business. Try to really look ahead and see what those key dates work and work for you. I love that. And, and having all those national, you know, holidays kind of ahead of time, it's good filler in a way too. It's like, yeah. okay, it takes a little bit of pressure off the day and it gives you kind of that inspiration for something to create ahead of time and get it on trending conversations. All those national holidays are equal that kind of virality effect conversation going on in the social sphere. Um, we do have an amazing question, Natalie, sure. from Peter um, on YouTube. And I hear this concern a lot from friends, from followers, from clients. Um, so Adita said, you know, he's working on going uh, live next week. Congratulations. And being a perfectionist is a big problem and making him paralyzed. Mm -hmm. Also, did we get burnout because there's that there's so much coming. There's, I, I can, social media can burn you out. So I guess, you know, any advice on how to avoid burnout, but how do we avoid the whole 
trying to be perfect and letting perfection paralyze us when it comes to social media. Let me just tell you, Dita, you are not alone. I have struggled with this and I've heard this so much. I'm curious, Natalie, what, what's your feedback here? You know, I, I will agree there with, with you, Adita, that it is so easy to feel the pressure and to feel like you have to really be everywhere to everyone every time. Uh, but what's amazing, and I often tell folks on social media to really live by the rule of quality over quantity. Um, if you're a person who is really, really good at taking photos and Instagram is your channel du jour that you really want to double down on, do that, right? Be really, really good on Instagram. Or maybe you say, you know what, Natalie, I only had five really, really good ideas this month for social media posting. That's okay. I'd rather see five solid posts than 15 mediocre ones that felt like you were really trying to check off a box. And your followers will respond accordingly. Um, nobody is going to unfollow you for not posting every single calendar day of the month if they are. I don't know if that's a follower you really want, let's be honest. So don't feel the pressure and put the pressure on yourself. Often that pressure is not gonna come from your followers. They want quality posts too. They don't need to see you every single day uh, if it doesn't mean that that post is gonna be wonderful. So agree, I so agree. I think that's one of the, the easiest ways people get paralyzed is thinking that they have to be on every channel. Sure. I'm really happy you addressed that at the top right away um so what are your what are what are your tips for clients even for yourself for those that want to kind of narrow in one two three social media channels how should we go about selecting what channels we should be present on for our brand for our business it's a really good question and there's not necessarily a formula for here are the channels that are right for you as much as you have to really think about what it is that your goals are on social media and what industry are you in. Um, so if you said, Natalie, I am a auto mechanic. Uh, I really want to grow a following. I want to be a consultant. I don't necessarily want to work for a shop. I want to build my personal brand. I might not tell you to go on Pinterest or Instagram as the most urgent place for you. Um, you might have a network of your family and friends on Facebook that actually might be the perfect place to build your business and talk about your services and your unique offerings. If you said, Natalie, I run a flower shop, I would give you the opposite advice. I would say get on Pinterest where you can find gorgeous inspiration, people who are looking to shop and people who are really looking for uh, wedding bouquet inspiration, uh, birthday bouquet inspiration, um, and, and much more visual platforms like Pinterest and Instagram. Um, again, not really a formula here, but understanding what each channel has in terms of their core demographic. Does it match up with your core audience that you want to build for your business? Use that as the starting point. And then don't be afraid to surprise and delight, right? If, if you are the auto mechanic, but you have these amazing time-lapse videos of you're like fixing a car up and, and, and that works really well for TikTok or even Instagram, Instagram Reels, get on there. Um, don't be afraid to sort of break the mold. But again, use your best judgment. Make sure you're somewhere where you know you have a chance to succeed. Um, and if that means you know investing in high quality video editing, et cetera, obviously you can consider a channel outside of your, your usual suspects. Yeah, and you know what, your answer actually leads me to, love, would love to know what industry does everybody you know currently work in, um, and what channel are you most interested in dominating in the year 2021? So let us know, drop it in a comment, it could be inspiration for everybody else who's also watching. Um, I know that for personally for me, for marketing, for social media, for, for business coaching, I see so much impact on LinkedIn. Um, I think, you know, the job seekers on LinkedIn and those that are taking their professional development really seriously yep. on LinkedIn. Um, I, I love having the LinkedIn learning platform. My courses are on there. So between LinkedIn and, of course, my Twitter chats on Twitter um, and Instagram kind of being the, the place where I share a little bit more of that lifestyle piece of myself, but a little bit more shedding that personal journey that I'm on in addition to my professional journey. Those are my top three channels for me. What are your channels that you're most focused on this year? I would I would echo what you've said. I mean, Instagram for me is, is our 
most engaged channel. It's where I get the most questions and the most feedback from my followers. So that's important to me. LinkedIn is also a really good one. We've just uh, grown our team to five and, and use LinkedIn to help find that fifth person from a talent standpoint. So if you are looking to grow your business, of course, LinkedIn is a great place to do that. Um, Twitter happens to be a channel I love also, Chelsea, like you, um, you know, from a media standpoint, I still think it's the easiest place to interact with editors, uh, other folks in your industry, and also share content. Um, so the retweet button, I still haven't found anything that is as easy to share information as the retweet button. Instagram makes it so hard uh, and Facebook's not much, much better. So um, if you are looking to sort of disseminate great content or become a thought leader or even weigh in on wonderful pieces in the media, I would say don't leave Twitter off your list. I so agree. So, I mean, step one being to really put this framework, this shell of a content calendar and kind of having that like 70% aware of what content and then just having, you know, 30% of that organic inspiration that's going to come on the day to day, um, taking all those national holidays into consideration. Sure. And really being mindful of where your target audience is on yeah. all social media so that you're spending your time where your audience is on social. In addition to that, it's like what social platform do you enjoy the most, right? It shouldn't feel so much like a chore. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of tedious details on social media. So, you know, which ones do you have the most fun showcasing your expertise and, and content on? Did we did we move into number two or have what is the second thing to consider? We that was kind of one and two right there. Yeah, I mean, I would say after the shell build, um, you know, you've got to now put the pencil to the paper, right? You've got to start writing some of these posts out in advance. Uh, what I often encourage people to do is find the time, identify the time that you are the most creative. Um, is that three in the morning? For some creatives, it absolutely is. Um, is it a weekend day? You know, is it is it perhaps before you've gotten into the minutia of your email first thing in the morning? Um, find that two or three hour block and write as many posts as you can for the given month ahead. Um, again, it doesn't mean that you have to finish it all in one session. Maybe you break it up to two different, three different sessions in a given month. Um, but don't don't feel like you have to sort of sit down every single week and write down posts if that's not your spirit. Um, if you're someone who you know has like a certain time that works for you or that you find yourself to be the most creative, go ahead and identify it, sit down, uh, give yourself a, a full coffee there, not yeah. a full coffee pot, um, and write those posts out um, and make sure you've obviously given, you know, a second read through a couple hours later when the caffeine wears off. So agree with that tip of like, finding the time you are the most creative to commit to the, the content creation piece yep. of the content calendar, because the last thing you want to do is go, all right, I'm going to bang out 10 posts and I'm so tired. I can barely keep my eyes open. Right. I alone have room in my brain for inspiration or creativity. One thing that I know works for me, and I'd love to hear something that works for you, Natalie, um, especially when I'm in a very big like writing uh, uh, exercise. So writing mm -hmm. for captions, for blog posts, for course creation. Um, for example, when I had to create 20 scripts for mm -hmm. LinkedIn, learning at a time, it was starting to become so daunting and tedious of, of writing these scripts. Uh, and I found this secret formula that works for me. I literally set my alarm clock for 530 in the morning. Okay. Like kind of before the sun comes up. It's this really like magical time where the world doesn't feel like it's it's moving just yet. Like nobody has started their day just yet. I do make my cup of coffee, very hot, piping hot cup of coffee. And I start writing by six o'clock in the morning. Yes. So by the time eight o'clock, nine o'clock rolls around, I have three hours of writing under my belt mm -hmm. and I don't think to check my phone. I don't think to check my email. I don't think to check social media. It's my quiet time, my... Yes my sacred time and I get so much work done. So, and I'm, and I'm not a morning person, no, no, no. But it works for me in kind of this, um, having this sacred space where I'm not feeling bombarded yep. to pump it out. Yep. So it could be something that everyone tries. That's my tip for kind of bulk writing and content creation there. I love it because I think that 
that that might be a time for many people where they're not getting emails from their boss. They're not getting, you know, tapped on the shoulder or phone calls. And so the, the urge to check your email or, you know, go back to something that's on your to-do list isn't as great. Um, so to so try the 5.30 AM thing or the evening thing um, as maybe the first place to be creative um, and see how it works for you. Absolutely. I think my dog is really uh, getting in on this topic as well. She's <laughs> crazy up in here. Um, okay, amazing. So uh, let's talk about step number three, moving into the content creation process, finding our sacred time, understanding what channels we want to dominate on, target audience. Lay it on us. Well, I, I was going to suggest what, what I think we answered Adita with earlier, which is this idea of quality over quantity, um, making sure you don't feel like you have to do 15 posts in a month if you can't really come up with things that feel authentic to your brand. Um, if it's five or seven wonderful things a month that only live on certain channels, absolutely fine. Um, and, and I can't help but include your dog in this conversation because what you what you really want to think about is like what give the people what they want. Again, the quality over the quantity. Um, is there an amazing story you have about a pet or and then I say this because, as you probably know, babies and puppies are social media gold what give the people what they want a little bit right let us experience you know whether it's a interesting story you have about uh, somebody in your family something you experienced a roadblock you had at work doesn't necessarily have to always be professional but what are those touch points um, that you've experienced that you know people uh, enjoy hearing about and maybe you can give them a little bit of a lens into yeah, i'm so happy you said that because i think you know when it comes to everyone's professional cat media and content creation they think where's that fine line between that the personal share and the professional share but one it should always be something you're comfortable with sharing yes uh, and that feels authentic to share with your audience sure. but sharing a little uh, a flavor of your life of your day-to-day -day, even the good bad the ugly right mm -hmm. um does create that human connection that we all strive to feel uh, through digital, through, through virtual, through social. And if you're missing that human connection, it feel, maybe it feels a little too promo, too salesy, too spammy, too billboard. That could be the reason why your content's not connecting. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And there's no formula for this either, but I usually encourage people, whether they're running a small business or a personal brand to strive for an 80 20 ratio give them 80 percent professional but don't be afraid to pepper in that 20 percent personal and often what happens at the end of the month when we're doing our reporting and i'm sure you know where i'm going with this the stuff that performs the best and really gets the highest engagement levels are those unexpected little nuggets of personal life uh, that we were able to pepper into that calendar Totally. I always love looking at like the top performing posts at the end of the month. And I'm always like, really? <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah. is tracking performance is, is so important. Yeah. So that segues us into that, that this topic of conversation, which is tracking our content, tracking our content performance. And what does that mean, Natalie, for those of us who are like, well, what are they talking about? And also maybe some favorite tools to help us understand those analytics so that we can really understand the patterns and, and favorite posts to do more, right? We want to give our audience what they're liking. So talk to us about that. Yeah. I mean, who would we be to spend all of this time investing in creating great content and then not check back to see what worked? Um, and also learn from that. What am I going to put in my next month's calendar? What should I avoid? Um, and, and what maybe elicited an unexpected response, perhaps positive, negative, or otherwise neutral? Um, I think what you what you ultimately want to do if you're starting out, um, especially if social media is something you're trying to, to grow from the ground up right now, is you want to leverage some of those wonderful free tools that Instagram and Facebook offer right built into their platform. So Facebook and Instagram insights are completely free. Um, you can really track a lot of wonderful things from who's following me, what gender, what cities, what is the age range? Um, and, and that I think in many cases informs what voice am I using uh, if I have a small business to talk to these people and what kinds of things might they be most interested in? Hey, that even might tell you 
if you're thinking about what kind of partners to work with or media companies to get press in, who would those people be most likely to open up the magazine and read from? Um, so, so really understanding your audience and your metrics is huge. Instagram also will tell you your top posts of that month, that year, that last 30 days, I think is the most important. If you're checking that once a month to really see what worked and what didn't. Um, and then if you're like, okay, Natalie, I've been using those tools. I want to dive in a little bit deeper. I want to look at, you know, my year to date, or I want to look at um, perhaps some of the uh, notable followers I've received, the notable engagement I've received. There's two options. Uh, one I really like called agency analytics. It sounds fancy. It's actually very reasonably priced. You don't have to have an agency to be a part of it. Uh, they'll give you more analytics than you would get built in. And then the other one is uh, Cerebro. Um, this is pretty cool. What they'll do is they will let you look at your own Twitter or Instagram following and analyze who are the most notable of your followers. So who are the people who have already baked in and, and, and committed to follow you? Here's a list of those people. Um, and, and that's kind of great too, especially if you get into the tens of thousands of followers, it's not so easy to know who's in that group that might be a really good partner um, or, or you know, someone to, to do a wonderful chat like this with. Uh, so it kind of just reminds you who's demonstrated an interest already opted into your page that you might want to work with down the road. Love that. And I, I also, I, I really do appreciate the amount of analytics we get per channel. Yeah. So if you've never even checked the insights on your LinkedIn, your Instagram, your Twitter, you know, that's a great place to start. And then agency analytics could be kind of that next step up. If you want to have like a, a monthly tool that you pay for. Um, I know that I, I, I just started dabbling with Metricool and the okay. R I C O O L, uh, and I you can connect you know multiple channels. One of the things I like about Metricool is it does all the things, all the features that you know um, top tweets, top performances, who's the most engaged in you, um, all the information you want to know. But also like let's say you're doing a product launch or a campaign and you want to track hashtag performance, you can actually track hashtag performance and even just pay per day. So you say you want, you want to track two weeks time, a month time before you commit to ongoing cost. Metrical does give you that liberty as well, which I, I like the kind of customizable, like I don't need to pay for this every month, but you know, I'm looking to track this two month campaign or how this product, you know, went off. Something to explore in your content strategy. Um, you know, there's lots of tools out there, but the analytics on each social channel does give you so much good information. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, when it comes to, you know, how to grow likes on your content, how to grow engagement, comment on your content, the analytics are going to help you, to help you. Uh, this is your top performing content. This content my audience is clearly liking. If you create more of it, it should, it should generate more likes, more engagement. But what are some of your other top tips for increasing the traffic, likes, and comments on your content across social? I mean, Chelsea, that's the number one question we get. Probably no surprise to you from our clients, from my followers, from the biggest brands in the world. They all want to know the answer. How do I get more likes on my comment, on my posts? And how do I get more followers? Help. I don't think we have enough followers. How do we reach a million? How do we reach 10,000 and get the swipe up? Everyone has these questions. So very normal to ask. Um, I think the thing that most often I realize people are not doing, which has a direct correlation to the growth of your channels, is actually not something that you would be doing on your own channels. So that surprises people. They're like, what am I doing wrong? How can I make my content better? Often it's not really about that. It's about what are you doing off your channels? What are you doing on third party channels? Are you spending time 15 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, looking at other people's content, leaving thoughtful comments, whether that's funny, interesting, you know, unexpected and drawing your you know, attention to your page. Um, and I think the the kind of key to the castle here is finding brands and and third party profiles that are very aligned to what you yourself would be posting about. Um, so perhaps if you are a, a record 
producer. I don't know why that was the first thing that came to my head. <laughs> maybe there's a record producer watching, maybe there's not. Um, are you commenting on the Instagram pages of music publications? Are you commenting on wonderful artists that you like, that you've worked with or haven't worked with yet? Um, are you eliciting support for perhaps that indie artist who hasn't necessarily broken into the industry yet? Um, and what's really kind of amazing is uh, if you do leave a comment and see that person come over to your page is, is giving a little love to that person saying, hey, I'm so glad you came over. Remember, social media is like having lunch with a friend. If you if your friend is spending the whole time talking about himself or herself and their dreams and their goals and their fears and their wishes and they never once ask you about yours, you're not going to have lunch with that friend very often. Social media is no different. Don't just constantly talk about yourself. Make sure that your followers and the people who uh, you're, you're engaged with also feel like you have an open ear for them. So, so, so true. And that's one of my biggest tips too, you know, for all the people that ask the same question, how do I get more likes, more followers? And I'm like, well, how much time in the day or the week are you spending engaging in others? Yeah. Oh, well, never. You yep. know, it's like, well, it's a two way street slash you engaging in other like minded people on social media is going to help get you on the radar mm -hmm. of those people so that they come back and, and consume your content, like your content, hopefully follow you for ongoing engagement. Yep. So, so important. I love the lunch analogy. I might have to take that. And, and give you credit because that's so true. You go to lunch with a friend that just talks about them and never asks how you're doing. So it, that is the perfect mindset to be approaching this social media two way conversation. Sure. Um, and that one of the other questions I get all the time is, you know, are there any tips or, uh, you know, added hacks or tricks that help with, you know, um, hashtags? Hmm. Do hashtags really increase viewership? I think they can. Um, I don't think that they're as important as perhaps people sometimes expect them to be. Um, and I think in some cases they will uh, be overused, right? You've you've seen somebody put 40 hashtags after a post or even sort of throughout a sentence, pepper in a bunch of hashtags and it ends up looking really, I don't know what the word is other than thirsty uh, in today's internet culture, but you don't want to appear desperate or look like you are dying for visibility. So if you had to add three to five hashtags to really help the post get more views, go for it, but don't abuse or overuse the hashtags. Um, they're, they're not helping you as much as I think in most cases hurting you. Yeah, and in so many cases, the analytics on that platform should tell you which hashtags drew in the most traffic. Yes. Yeah. Again, you can be like, is this hashtag worth my worth my real estate on this post, right? Um, and, and again, like even what time should I be posting on social? Analytics are gonna tell you those top performance or peak times on your channel you know, use those peak times and see if that does give you a bump in, in your content. Yeah, and think about your followers too, right, Chelsea? So if I know that my followers are mostly, you know, 20 something year olds, you know, post-college grads looking for career advice, which happens to be true, um, I'm not necessarily going to be uh, posting at 6 a.m. because, I don't think that the average 20 something year old is awake at that time, is looking at social media at that time. They might be going to sleep at that time in some cases, but you know, I'm usually going to be uh, talking to someone sort of you know, middle of the day, uh, perhaps they're checking their phone on their lunch break or at five or six when they're out of work. Um, we're not, you know, you know, versus if your community uh, is, is, you know, you have a mom centric or dad centric, parent centric community, uh, perhaps it's the opposite. They're waking up with their kids at five, six a.m. Perhaps all night. I know we're going to both experience that soon, Chelsea, uh, since we're both expecting. But you know, <laughs> think about your audience. When do they want content from you? Um, and and give them again what they want. There's a theme here. Um, so so look at that their needs first, and then sort of make your posting decisions based on that. So true. And again, it's all about taking your audience 
into consideration. Sometimes I think we, you know, and this is not to be a not, uh, you know, a knock on, on, on any of you or any of us, but sometimes I think we're a little too self-absorbed in our content calendar and our content creation and our profile that we forget. It's really about what the audience wants. It's really about what our community is interested. It's really about when our community is most engaged, if you want to see the traction back on your content and back on your channel. So it is that two way street or put it, put it, putting yourself in the mindset of your target follower, customer, um, or, or consumer, right? Sure. So, um, so, so many amazing and really like foundation tips for approaching building our content calendar and even social media um, strategy, consistency, and be, and uh, behaviors, best practices on social. Is there, any, but, but we're going to have, wrap up with a quick tip, but is there anything you know, like if people just knew this, if people hmm. just did this, you know, or things I say all the time to my clients that I wish everyone knew. Mm -hmm. did, did, have we forgotten anything at this point? One thing I think I would I would encourage people to do is we mentioned that you want to leave comments on third party pages. Make sure they're really thoughtful and not just a thumbs up emoji or a heart. Um, if you do want your page to get recognized and recognized for what it is that you do, um, maybe you're you know trying to elicit something funny because you're a comedian or you have a certain brand that has a certain you know comedic aesthetic, those comments have to be laugh out loud funny, right? We need to see 28 people like that comment and make it rise to the top of that long comment list on the on the person's page. Um, don't go to Chrissy Teigen's page as the first page you're gonna leave a comment on, you're probably not gonna be the most liked comment on that page. Instead, go to someone who has you know eight or 10 or 20,000 followers where you kind of have a chance of getting to that to that most commented on, uh, I'm sorry, most liked comment. Um, and that that kind of would be a follow up to my earlier advice, uh, really just, just double down and be thoughtful um, and don't just sort of, you know, leave comments anywhere to elicit a response. It's not going to work unless you, again, put in some time and thought. Quality over quantity, yeah. again, right? Like make sure it's quality. And for the, your response to someone that's like, I want a million followers or, you know, I want 100,000 followers versus the person that has that more micro influence. That's yeah. Like, and I think sometimes we don't understand the difference between someone who has a million followers who are unengaged right. versus micro influence having 10,000 followers, 5,000 followers who have a more engaged audience. Can you kind of just give us the, the difference and the impact that it's not always just about the follower count? It's a little, it's really more about the engagement. Yeah. I mean, the number one question is again how do i get more followers and my number one response is why why do you want so many more followers there's nothing you can't do uh at 10k that you can do at 100k with regards to swipe up or any other features on instagram um, if it's an exercise of ego uh often i will i will encourage people to not be on social media for those reasons even though it seems very uh, counterintuitive social media is a celebration of all the things we love about ourselves in so many ways. But um, I think if you're if you're looking to go on social media and you want a really big audience, I would just look inward and say, why? Why is it that I feel like I need a million or a hundred K? Um, and is there something I can accomplish at that level that I can't accomplish with, to your point, 10,000 loyal built in followers who would go to the ends of the earth for me, buy my products, give me good advice, call me out when I'm doing something I, I shouldn't be. If that, if that is your goal, um, you will be successful. But if you are looking to simply hit a certain milestone or number to impress people, um, I think you're in it for the wrong reasons. As, as they say in the Bachelor franchise, you're not here for the right reasons. <laughs> I caught up on The Bachelor last night. And it's me just too. Terribly great. <laughs> oh I'm hooked. I'm hooked. <laughs> well, I, um, I can't echo all of the things that you have shared with us on this live stream more as I practice what you preach. And, um, you know, yes, my follower count might look large on or larger on, on other channels, but it is truly about more of the micro community and micro influence and generating that engagement. If you want to see loyalty, 
right? People sticking around, staying engaged, and also conversion rate, right? Mm -hmm. Not people that follow and like, but like someone that actually becomes a client of yours or a customer of yours. Sure. So uh, I'm so appreciative of everything that you've shared. So before I let you go, I'm going to give you the floor for just a quick tip, even if it's a recap, um, you know, in, in a 60 second fashion of five things to do for your content calendar or just, you know, that quick tip of all things content creation and social media focused, um, you know, what would that be and what would you want everybody to know? 60 seconds. So if you're looking to create a 30 day social media calendar, the five steps really from start to finish, number one, create a 30 day shell. It doesn't have to be a fully baked calendar. It can simply be an outline of what posts you want for the month. It can have social media commemorative holidays in it. Uh, it can also have ideas for things that you later flesh out. Step two is going to be actually finding that time of day or week where you are the most creative. Spend those two, three hours writing out as many posts as you can, leaving room for about 20 or 30% of your calendar to be impromptu. One of the things we love so much about social media is that we do love an unexpected post or to capitalizing on something that we couldn't have predicted. Uh, step three is really remembering quality over quantity. You don't have to be everything everywhere to everyone at all times. Pick the channels you really think you're going to thrive at. And of course, don't feel like you have to post every single day. No one needs that from you. We'd rather see the great content you're capable of making. Uh, step four, don't forget to comment and engage on those third party channels leave a meaningful comment, something thoughtful that will elicit a response. Social media is not just about what you post, but about being supportive of other people's posts, of course. And step five is check back, see what worked, look at your analytics. They're built right into the apps in many cases, and you can see those insights and you can really make decisions for the future based on what's worked for you in the past. Amazing. Check, 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 check. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Give us a little teaser of, you know, how we can get in touch with you, stay in touch with you, learn from you, even work with you for those who might want to know and bump up their, their game this year. Well, it's no surprise I am available on all of the social media channels, although I did say that Instagram is my favorite, so I'll give you my handle there. It's at Natalie Zafat, which is my name, uh, and that's where you can find more social media tips or submit questions if there's something we didn't get to today. I so appreciate all these words of wisdom. And if only everybody could really like take the time to listen to this interview, the foundations and essentials for social media growth are all right here. So I, I really so appreciate it. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. We'll see you here next week on C-Suite. And again, thank you. Have a great one, everybody. Thanks, Chelsea. Bye, everyone.